All right, folks, welcome back. So I do apologize, and I appreciate your patience, because Friday we had an issue with our internet locally, so I'm not sure what was going on, but uh, we had an outage in our area. Today has since been restored, which I'm very thankful for. But on this review, lecture, teaching, I'm going to cover a couple things, and I want you to understand what it is that we're doing, so that way we're not taking away the incorrect things and focusing on the things that are not salient to the discussion. But I'm also looking for you to align yourself as to why I'm doing index futures trading specifically recently and that I'm not so active in Forex. Before we get into it, we're going to look at the dollar index here. And I want you to see that we've taken out the short term high in the short term low. So we have a high here that took price higher, broke that, traded lower, took that low out there. That is the topic and teaching of this lecture today. In your notes, I want you to create a section for dealing ranges. Okay, whenever you hear me refer to a dealing range, what I'm looking at is a range where price has taken out buy side then reversed and taken out sell side by the movement here okay that makes this range from here to here a dealing range okay so an ict dealing range whenever you hear me refer to that why am i working with a specific range why am i looking at one high and this high why am i pulling my fib from this low to that high all those questions are answered right here so we have a dealing range from here to here. So in this range, the question is, is how is it useful? Well, prior to this run up here, what has the dollar been doing? It's been bullish. I have been bullish on dollar. I've been looking for higher prices in dollar. And for the most part, it's been delivering okay. Uh, we've entered a little bit of a sloppy range in here this past week, and that's fine. So when this low is taken out here and sell side is taken, I'm not looking at as a market structure shift where it goes up to here, runs to a gap, and then go lower because I'm trading against the primary uptrend if I do that. That's the same as trying to pick a top, and I don't try to do that. I've lost a lot of money as a young man trying to do that. So I submit myself to the market being likely to follow its higher time frame bias, trend, momentum direction okay so i look at that run below that low here as accumulation of sell side liquidity for the purposes of buying it by smart money so stops here being triggered that's a flood of sell orders coming into the marketplace and why is that useful and how is it useful smart money if they're bullish and they're going to align themselves with the higher time frame trend as well they're going to buy those sell stops so i'm going to look at that run below here as a means of buying dollar. I'm not specifically buying dollar. I don't ever trade the dollar, but I use it as a barometer. What does that mean? I'm using it in my analysis to determine if this is gonna go higher, then foreign currency should go lower. If this is gonna go lower, foreign currency should go higher, vice versa, it's like a teeter-totter. So how this is useful is the dealing range that's been created by running out the short-term low here, I expect sell side to be accumulated so that way the market starts to trade higher what would it trade for well the dealing range has been defined by this low being taken out and this high here taken out so we have buy side here sell side has been taken and if it turns higher once it starts to pull away from this low sell side resides here and if i'm bullish because i'm sticking with the higher time frame trend i'm not trying to pick tops the draw on liquidity is going to be that high because that's where buy side is. So I'm not gonna look at this run up into this range here for a fair value gap to sell off on dollar. That's not what I'm doing. I don't look for that, my students know that. So I'm gonna be anticipating this range to be taken out so the smart money buys the sell stops and then sells to the buy stops. There are traders that wanna be short dollar. If they're shorting dollar, they'll put their protective stop loss right above the short term high here and that provides what? buy side liquidity how is that useful 
the smart money that buys the sell stops here will offset to those buy stops above the short-term high. So they're buying low, selling high. Who are they selling to at a higher price? The buy stops resting above here. That's narrative. Okay. So looking at the dollar, we didn't do very much last week. We kind of stayed inside the range here. So here's Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday's range to Friday, just a consolidation week. Okay. Euro dollar. This pair is, in my opinion, very frustrating right now because it's not trying to move very much at all. And we've moved back into this range here and we're just stalling. I don't have a strong conviction one direction or the other. So if you look at this market here, is it obvious that it wants to go above these highs or below these lows? Now, if we had a show of hands, <laughs> there is probably going to be a, a large degree of division. Some of you are going to be looking for lower prices. Some are going to be looking for higher prices. Now, the way ICT, me, myself, the analyst defines low probability so that way the trader can engage in the setup. The analyst inside of me has to make a determination of high probability trade conditions. So how do I define that? I've already taught it to you. This is for your journal, if you, in case you haven't already taken note with this. High probability conditions with my concepts and my analysis method is the algorithm presenting something in price that is so one-sided, it's so obvious that it wants to go higher or go lower, that it's very difficult for you to make a justification for the opposing side. In other words, if you're bullish and you think the price is likely to go higher, does this condition or market present next to no opportunity to present a shorting opportunity? So it's going to be obvious. This is high probability. If there is a way for you to determine a likelihood of a, an opposing setup, that is not my definition of high probability. So what are we waiting for as traders? What are we being patient for? Because I preach that all the time. You're waiting for that one-sidedness to the marketplace. And it might not trade like that for a day or two or maybe even a week. And you have to prepare yourself to have that patience to wait for the setup to present itself to you with high probability conditions. Now, how does this relate to Forex in my apprehension? to engage with it recently. There is no high probability setup in Euro. It can go either way. It can run for the buy side here, or it could run for the sell side. Is that high probability? Absolutely not. The market comes back up into this fair value gap. It ran up into that. Why didn't it drop? I don't know. Why didn't it go higher? I don't know. Do you hear what I just said? Your teacher, your mentor, the guru with the horseshoe, the luck in my analysis is trimming away all of this nonsense. This is chaff. Just because the markets are printing candles, I'm not trying to predict every single fluctuation in every single market. I want to go where the iron is hot and I want to strike it when it's there because I'm going to shape a winner out of a market that presents the opportunity that's high probability. So. What I'm showing you here, notice I'm not taking you into where the market's going to go to next because I don't know. I don't know that right now. So I'm not in Forex. Does that make sense? Why am I going to gamble just to entertain you? I'm not going to do that. I'm not here to show you that I can get wrong a lot of times in markets that I never would have touched in the first place. See the logic behind that? Here's British Pound. Now, Pound took out its short-term low here. That's something that the euro dollar did not do, respectively. So I'm kind of like questioning, is that an SMT divergence, correlated pair SMT divergence? Now, here's for your journal. Correlated SMT divergence is when you are looking at correlated markets like British pound versus US dollar is closely correlated to euro versus dollar. Generally, they'll move in sympathy with one another. But in instances like we have here, if I was bullish, for instance, Say I was bearish dollar and bullish foreign currency. If I saw this divergence between this low and this low here, making it lower in cable or British pound versus US dollar versus that of going back up to euro, that low here 
And here we have a higher love formed in euro than that of cable. You see that? So that's a divergence. So if I was bearish on dollar, that would indicate to me that it's time to be buying euro or buying cable. In this instance, if I was bearish dollar and bullish foreign currency, which currency would I buy, euro or cable? I would buy euro because euro failed to make the lower low because in sense of comparing relative lows to relative lows, euro has failed to make a lower low. So that would indicate if those conditions were there. And I'm not suggesting that they are, folks. We're just talking hypothetically here. Since cable went lower to take out that low here, that's a stop running event. And euro dollar is failing to make that lower low. So it's saying I'm not willing to go down there. And if dollar were bearish, this would indicate this is the relative strength leader. And then we, I would expect this currency to rally higher. Now, that does not mean that I won't trade cable long. Sometimes there's other factors that are outside the scope of this. It's, it's not that I'm trying to keep it from you. It just would re require me a lot of teachings that have to help support the reasons why I would say I would still go long British pound versus US dollar, even though euro failed to make a lower low. Some of those things would be the economic counter coming up. Um, interest rates, differentials, all of those things, which again are outside the scope of this. And I promise I'll touch on those as we go through the rest of this year, but I don't want you thinking or having the obligation placed on me that I have to explain every single little detail because I mentioned something. If you spend time with me, and hopefully that's what you're here for. You're not here to just watch one week or a couple of videos and call it quits or think you know it all because you're not going to do that. But I want to give you a very deep dive into my concepts and my analysis style that aligns itself with the algorithm. Here is the Australian dollar versus US dollar. You tell me, is it likely to take out the sell side here or the buy side here? Now, it's real close to these, so wouldn't it feel natural to say it should spike down here and take that out? Logically, that's what I think it should and could do. But I could be wrong. I've been in markets where it's done this before and then ran away from it because this is the logical level that everybody would look to see a breakout below. I'm not a breakout trader. I look to see price run into these levels. That's my setup. So I'm not looking for a breakout to continue in. I'm looking for a run below an old low or above an old high, and I'm targeting liquidity. I'm not trading patterns. I'm not looking for anything harmonic. I'm not looking for supply and demand because that doesn't exist unless you're looking at commodity prices, which I talked a little bit about on my Twitter space on this past Saturday. If you've listened to that and you found it insightful, give me a comment below and I'd appreciate that. If it wasn't any help to you, you know, you're welcome to leave that as well. As long as it's respectful, every comment's accepted. But I don't have a strong opinion about trading the Aussie dollar right now either. So I'm not touching it. Here's the dollar versus Canadian dollar. We mentioned how it took this short term high up, bumped it, started to break lower, and who knows what it was going to do. And we had a little bit of a retracement on Wednesday and Thursday, and then Friday we had a washout. To me, it left relative equal highs. It could have easily swiped those, but it's having a little bit of a heaviness in the marketplace, and it might want to trade down into this gap here. Do I know which one it's going to do right now? No, because I can't frame it with high probability on one side or the other. So am I going to trade this personally? No. So I have a... A conundrum. Okay, I'm stuck. If I'm looking at Forex and I have these shackles of uncertainty on me, and you as my students, even my private group, they're looking at me like, you know, ICT, you know, pull your magic wand out and, and do some magic here with Forex. And that's why I've been very candid with them and I've been candid with you. I do not feel Forex is high probability at the moment. Will it stay like this? No, it will not. Forex is not dead. OK, I talked a little bit about that as well in Twitter space on this past Saturday, but I'm not trying to promote you to join Twitter. You can literally pull this up and not have a Twitter account. So don't think I'm trying to pull people to Twitter 
or to follow me. I don't care. I want the follows on the YouTube channel, but you're welcome to go on the Saturday rants that I do. Uh, you may not be a fan of that, but it's kind of like a motivational thing. It's kind of like the realign yourself after the previous week of trading. And sometimes I'll just talk about things I endured in my development. And sometimes it's funny to listen to because they were real, <laughs> they were real events I had to, had to work through. And other times it'll be things that I think are noteworthy. And if they delete my channel over there on Twitter, I could care less. Okay. But this channel here, I want to preserve and I'm going to keep a lot of the tinfoil hat discussions off of it. Here's the gold futures market. Okay. Look at this market for real, folks. Does this look high probability to you? Is it going higher? Or is it going lower? Your guess is as good as mine. That's why I'm not talking about gold. Think about it. We traded from here to here. We've been consolidating. Gun to my head. Okay, gun to my head. Long-term bullishness on dollar. It might resume. That would be pressure on gold. Gold should go lower. Attack the sell side over here. Is it high probability? No. Would I trade it? No. Because it can do one of two things. Stay consolidated or run up and trade against my ex expectation and dollars slip lower. That's against my analysis. That's where I'm okay with being wrong because I'm not taking a trade that would lead to that as a monetary loss. It would be a bruise to my ego. It would be a scratch in my journal where I say my expectations were not seen in the delivery of price. And this is my observations. I'm not saying I'm so stupid. I messed this up. I'm never going to get this. This is too hard for me. Why am I struggling so much? This should have been easier. I should have learned it by now. That's all negative self-talk. And when you include that in your posts on social media, or if you include it in your annotations on your chart or in your journal, you are literally poisoning your developing self. You don't want to do that. You want to reassure yourself positive self-talk. That's how you do it. You're tricking your brain to retain the positive aspects of what has transpired, whether you've taken a monetary loss or you just missed an opportunity. Any of those conditions are going to be helpful to you if you use positive self-talk. That means telling yourself you saw it coming beforehand. This is what you look for in the setups. And what will happen is your subconscious will retain that because it's a feel-good moment. You're creating an artificial feel-good moment in your journal. You're logging back data in moves. And if you have taken a trade and it was a losing trade, you go into it and look for the positives because you're going to get it wrong sometimes like I do. And when I was journaling young, I went into the charts and discovered that if I went in and I recorded, okay, I had this trade incorrect, but I'm encouraged because my bias was incorrect as a trader. But the method says if it was going to go high, it would go down to a fair value gap or take out sell side liquidity and then rally up to a specific price level. And I would focus on that. So you're always looking for the silver lining. That's how you stay positive and you endure drawdown, periods of uncertainty where you have to sit on your hands and do nothing. And that's a very hard lesson to learn. You need a mentor that has done that and can justify why that is a good thing. Not, well, you got an edge, you got to get there and trade it. You know, losing's part of the game. Money man's going to save your rear end. Get out there and go for it. That's stupid. That's somebody that I guarantee you is not making money. That's somebody that just wants to rile up the troops. And hopefully it works out in their favor and they can champion themselves in front of everyone and say, see, we're killing it. I am not afraid to tell you, sit still. Sit on your hands. Wait. That comes with maturity. That comes with someone that has endured financial loss to the degree that probably most of you would throw your guts up. So to avoid all those personal experiences and financial loss, I teach the way I teach. And that sometimes for most people in the younger age brackets, I'm viewed as a very boring monotone teacher. I'm not going to get out here and, you know, bang pots for you, <laughs> get you all worked up and show Lamborghini lifestyle. I'm not going to do that. Because none of that's going to help you. These kind of lessons I'm showing you here, this is the thing that you need to understand. 
looking through the markets as a whole, going through them individually, is there a one-sidedness to all of them? Because if there's a risk on risk off scenario, they should all generally be moving in the same direction or hinting at that. And we're not seeing that at all. Not at the very moment we're not. So I feel comfortable being in stock index futures. Crude oil. Now, we've been recently enduring a lot of issues with crude oil. This, let me take you back to when crude oil dove 40 some dollars negative. So we went under zero. The cost of oil went below zero. And refineries were paying people to come pick up their oil because it takes time for them to turn those pumps off during all of the row, we'll call it, because I'm not going to put the things in this video that would make it otherwise flagged for things. Just know that all the things we've been enduring for the last two years led to that collapse in oil. We were bearish. I was looking for bearish prices on oil. I called 15, maybe as low as $13 a barrel on oil. And that very day, it literally collapsed and went negative. Nobody could have expected that. No one of no one on this planet would have said oil is going below zero and to the tune of negative forty dollars. So you're all asking why is energy prices so high? Well, <laughs> they lost a lot of money, folks. A lot of money. People weren't able to travel. They weren't able to go anywhere. So them being them. They're creating this situation. They're making all that money they lost back and with interest. So you're seeing all of this pull higher in crude oil and gas prices because they have taken a huge loss. They took a bath. So now they have to recoup that. How do they do that? Well, you're looking at the price chart here. So because there's a lot of manipulation in this market, there's a lot of uncertainty and it's a lot of knee jerk reactions to anything at all about energy prices, this market's going to flip out and overreact. Is that high probability? No. So that's why I look at this market. Now, everything I just said, I want you to compare and contrast how much better, how much more plain, more simplistic and clear that this market's going to be versus what I just showed you in the previous discussions. Here we have the daily chart of the S&P. And obviously you're going to be asking, okay, I'm a Forex trader. This is getting boring, ICT. You know, you're going to have to start talking about currencies or I'm unsubscribing. Unsubscribe. And you will find that you've given yourself the greatest disservice ever. Because what I'm showing you here is the same thing that works in Forex when Forex is moving right. When the markets are more liquid, why aren't the Forex markets liquid ICT? Well, because of the past two years and the effects of that and the supply chain and global commerce and exchange, that's what's strangling those currencies. Plus, we have a WAR, you paying attention, going on. And you have to literally weigh all those factors in to your analysis and I understand, folks, you have these multi-level marketing companies ran by goobers and, and young kids trying to tell you that you can get rich by doing stupid stuff. And none of them actually can show you a, a millionaire student. Nobody has a million million dollars that have made money with their things. None of their teachers are making millions of dollars. None of them have been profitable. And it's easy to get sucked up into that thinking, OK, it's just so easy to turn my phone on, put this thing on my chart, put a couple indicators on here. And when it crosses this and just below that, I'm going to do this and that. And it's easy. And I can do 15 entries on the same idea and share that on social media. And it's going to make me feel good because someone's going to put a little like behind my post. No, that's the wrong way to do it. A sober minded. Principle oriented speculator has to weigh out all the things that I'm laying before you right now. If it's boring, it's right. Trust me when I tell you that if it's boring, it is right because big money is not going in in erratic price action. It is not doing that. 
It's looking for a systematic edge with visibility. How can we go in and discern where risk is? How can you define risk? In all the markets I've shown you prior to this one, there's no real way of de determining and defining risk. How far is it going to go against you if you get in? Who knows? I don't know. So if I can't define the risk, why on earth would I even put my money behind it? I wouldn't. And maybe you shouldn't either. But I know some of you want to be hot shots and you want to gamble. And you want to be the guy that gets there and be the contrarian. Well, this is not that kind of market, folks. And let me say this also in this lecture. In my 30 years of trading, let me underscore this very plainly and succinctly. This is the absolute hardest trading has ever been. It's the hardest it's ever been. We have so many things coming at us as speculators to change or inspire certain sentiment. All the data we're getting is fake. It's manipulated. It's contrived. For instance, look at the inflation number. <laughs> Do you feel that inflation number is accurate when you go to the grocery store right now? How about when you go to the pump and you fill up your gas tanks? Does it feel like that that data that they're releasing for inflation is in alignment with reality? <laughs> no way. Absolutely not. But to the average Joe or Jane, that feels like, well, they're telling us what it is. And it's probably not as bad as we all think it is. No, it's worse. It's worse, folks. And it's going to get worse. So... You have to be sober-minded with your spending now, and you have to be sober-minded about your analysis and what you're going to participate in. And this market right here is giving that to you. It's showing you everything that a trader would want to see and find in price action to support the notion that it is high probability setups. Now I'm going to go into as the reason why that's the case. And also kind of like give you the underlying tone of why I've been able to be accurate with this market publicly showing it and sharing it with everybody. They can see it. I've put myself out there where I think the market's going to go, why it should do this, why it should do that. And I'll leave it to you to determine whether or not this is useful information. But if you don't want to look at the markets like this, I promise you this. You are never going to learn what I teach and find consistency in it. Not because it doesn't work, because it works like gangbusters and is highly precise. But you won't subject yourself to the requirements that are needed to be developing properly and have the right mindset. That's why I talk so much, because I'm telling you the things that you have to think about while you're developing. Not get to the point, give me an entry strategy, ICT. Where's my stock going to be and where do I take profits? I got time to do this. You're going to fail. And I promise you, I would put a million dollars on that. Because none of my students came through fast-tracking it, cherry-picked pieces out of it, and made millions of dollars. They've never done that. And unfortunately, the way the world is today, they want dollar menu, have it right now, my way, mentorship. And expect unrealistic expectations and results. It doesn't work that way. The market doesn't owe you anything. I don't owe you anything. That doesn't taste good, does it? But that's the reality. And you have to align yourself with, hey, this market's going to try to kick me in, in the gut. It's trying to take me out. It's not here for your pleasure. It's not here for you to go in and just pull dollar bills off of the money tree and have no consequences, no thorns in your finger as you reach for them. The reality is, this is war. <laughs> you got to go in ready to do battle, but you have to know when to pick your shots. You have to know when to flank it. You have to know when to retreat. That's cutting losses short, allowing your stop loss to be the determination that you were wrong in that trade idea. Retreat is not defeat. And sometimes standing down, that means don't engage, don't go forward. They're not running backwards. You're just sitting still. With those other markets I've made mention of prior to this market here, you are standing down. Doesn't matter what you see out there in front of you. You're standing down. This market, where I actually have been engaging, let's look at the differences between it and what I've shown so far in the other markets. 
All right, so we have an old low here, relative equal highs, the market trades above that, then breaks down and takes out the sell side here. What does that make this range here to here? A dealing range. Now, how is that useful? Well, we're in a very long protracted consolidation. It wasn't like a short little run from here to here. It was elongated. This is a daily chart. So this is a lot of time going sideways essentially, but it took buy side and then eventually aimed for sell side. When that happens on a daily chart and we're entering a seasonal tendency of the first part of the year, I'm looking for sustained price moves. In the second half of the year, I'm looking for sustained price moves there as well. So apart from the details that lead to that, and I'll talk a little bit about that in topical studies, but again, I'm trying to keep this conversation germane to the topics and make it useful to you. But I'm going to introduce some topics that will branch off into in the coming weeks and months. So the dealing range high, dealing range low. Why is that a dealing range again? We took both sides, buy side and sell side out. What's the bias now? Bearish. All of this range in here, we're looking for areas that anticipate a run back up into a premium. Short term high, short term low, it runs up into a premium here, sells off. It creates relative equal highs, sell side's taken here. So once it has taken the sell side here, what's the market likely to do? Revert back to buy side. Even though it's bearish, where's the buy side? Like a neon sign, relative equal highs. Bumps up to it, then does what? You have now a new dealing range. You have a dealing range from low because it took out the sell side and the buy side's taken here. So your dealing range is from here to here. What is the usefulness in that? You're anticipating the market to trade back down to a discount and eventually to its sell side. Discount array below 50% of here to here. This fair value gap is a target. So you're going to be looking for areas once it sells off. Here's a fair value gap. Break lower. Break lower. Target. Filled. Sell side. Relative equal lows. Tags it. So now we have this dealing range from here to here. Why is that a dealing range? We've taken buy side here and sell side's been taken here. So from here to here, you start doing analysis inside of that range. Look at all the back and forth in here. And then we get to this level here and it's more energetic. When I see that, I identify this as the dealing range high to here to here, but I will refine it down to the most energetic price swing inside of the dealing range. So I'm going to use this range here from high to low. How's that useful? From here to here, I'm going to be looking for a equilibrium price point or premium to go short because the bias is what? Bearish. I publicly made that known even on YouTube. I said we're entering a seasonal tendency here where we go into May where it's bearish. Did it deliver? Of course it did. Now, this gap here, we see it trade up into it here. Sells off, comes up, up into it here, fails to go into it there. But look at all these opportunities where it could have filled in that gap, but it didn't. Broke lower. That indicates to me that this is a breakaway gap. I will talk about gaps in its own topical study, but for now, this is a breakaway gap, meaning it's going to most likely stay heavy and run where? In our bias. What's that direction? Lower. So we have sell side below here now. So we expect Mark's price to trade lower below that. It does so, and then keeps on trading lower and creates a short-term low here, rallies back up into a gap, drops down once more, takes sell side. So now buy side is where it's likely to revert back to. And from this high to that low, that's our focal point for our study. So inside this range, I want you to think about what you see. Study this, pause the video, make notes of it, and then watch the rest of the video. If you do not pause the video, folks, I know some of you like to reply back, I'm not going to pause the video. This is that kind of lesson where you do not get the benefit. Accept the fact that this is a long video. Accept it because it's good stuff. This is stuff that literally makes money, okay? This is the stuff that helps you not lose so much money. This is how you find the setups that I'm teaching you to look for. But if you don't do these parts, these interactive studies, and don't pause the video, 
You've cheated yourself. And then you're going to complain in the comments or in other places around the internet and saying, ICT stuff so convoluted. It's complicated. It's not complicated. You're just not doing what's required. So who's failing here? You are if you don't pause the video. All right, so I have the chart kind of aligns that we can focus on that range here. So inside that range, again, from here to here, we have a buy side liquidity pool right there. It trades up and purges buy side. Why is that likely to occur? Because we're bearish. We're going into a seasonal tendency where the market is likely to trade lower. So anytime it runs back above buy side liquidity, it's likely to sell off. Once it accumulates those buy orders, it's going to target what? The sell side below that low here. And it does so here. So sell side is now purged. So this is an area where if you're a swing trader and you don't want to be a day trader because a lot of folks are like, hey, man, you know, I can see that intraday trading is amazing and it's awesome. And you and your students are able to do a lot of things that are highly precise. I just can't do it, Michael. I can't. I don't have the time. I don't have the lifestyle. Uh, my requirements at my job, my business, I'm in school, you know, I just can't do it. Give me something I can trade with on a higher time frame daily chart. This is it. How is this any different from what I teach in the lower time frame? It's simply changing the time interval. Everything I'm teaching you is fractal. The algorithm runs across all the time frames, all of them. It starts at a higher time frame, runs its way down through the time frames, and it refers to all of these locations. The algorithm is highly complex, but the concepts of engaging with it is not complex. You have to be specific and oriented to the high level of detail to navigate each one of these time frames and put things in their proper place and context. So in short, if we're bearish, I like to look for a short term high taken out and accumulate short positions. Who's accumulating short positions above old highs? Smart money. They held price there. Why? Because they were allowing traders to engage this as what? A bull flag. Retail, retail sees that. Oh, look at this doji down here. It ran up. Support is now being found here because that was resistance. And that is now what? A continuation of a buy side run higher with a bull flag. It's going to run for this area here because that's resistance. And the opposite took place. We were bearish here. The market trades lower, attacks the sell side, runs in, spends time down here, and then we have Friday's price movement. So let's discuss liquidity a little bit deeper. Okay, This is one of those lessons where you're going to be like, man, this makes a lot of sense. And you can't find it in books. Okay, Today's date, think about it now, today's date in June 2022. I'm teaching this for the first time. Even my paid mentorship group doesn't know this lesson. So if anybody out there takes this information and repackages it, you know it's came after me. This is what the algorithm does. Okay. I want you to think like this because this is what the algorithm, when it runs certain macros, macros are a short list of orders of instruction. Do this, do that. Okay. The if, then, or. That that logic behind how the price is being designed, delivered, and booked. It is not buy and selling pressure. It is not your pattern. Nothing harmonic. No crossing over of moving averages. No oversold, overbought indicators. None of that stuff. Not Wolf Waves. Not Elliott Waves. None of that stuff. Wyckoff. None of it has anything to do with how price is booking and how it's delivered. What I'm about to show you, this is it. We have now a dealing range. This low was taken out here. This high was taken out here. So now we have this high down to that low. How is that useful? Well, if we strip this away, I want you to think about the simplest of things that retail traders use. And I started this way, same way in 1992, folks. The same procedure of looking for classic support and resistance because they want to sell you on the easiest thing going in because that way you'll put money in an account thinking it's going to work and then you are now fleeced 
They don't care if you stay in the business long enough. The, the statistics already state that most people blow their account in the first 30 days, let alone majority of them by 90 days. So they want you to get in there feeling like you can do it real easy. It's simple. They make these stupid little books, stupid little courses, and they trick you. They rook you into thinking that, hey, all it has to do is go down to an old level where it bounced before, and it's probably going to go up. Or it's going to go up to a level where it bounced down before, and it's probably going to go down once it goes there again. Because, hey, history repeats itself, right? Yes, the history does repeat. And the only aspect of that that is true is that losing traders follow that logic. So we're looking inside this range here. Okay, this is our specific dealing range. What do you see? Before I go further, wait a minute, ICT, you just said that's a dealing range, right? These are relative equal highs. It went above into the fair value gap with this here. And we never were able to go higher. So I'm looking at that as that's the cap on the marketplace. And it's likely going to be a breakaway gap. That means it doesn't fill right away until it fulfills lower level objectives on price down here. So what do you see in here? Pause the video. And when you're ready to continue, unpause it. All right, so we have this high to that low. Why am I picking this high? Because it has the most energetic price run away from it. It's the most recent one that has that energy going lower. The delivery of the candles moving away from it quickly. That's what I'm really getting at. So I'm framing it with the logic that this is likely to stay open, not rebalance, and the market's going to drive lower. So our range from here to here, that's what I'm measuring, and equilibrium is here. So above that level, this level here, what, we're, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for buy side. But classic support and resistance idea is this. We taken out this low, relative equal lows, okay? This break below it here is shallow and it's short-lived. And then we broke down aggressively through it. So classic support and resistance traders are going to do what? What are they going to be thinking about that low once it broke through it here more meaningfully? They're going to assume that that was support broken now turn what resistance, right? So, so they would expect price to trade up into that level right here and then trade down from there. Not understanding any of the logic as to why it would do this at all. That's narrative. That's the reason why retail traders suck, because they just simply look for support and resistance or they look for patterns for pattern's sake, and they're fooled by randomness. The algorithm is not random. So I teach you to look at a range and define it in the scope of premium to discount. Equilibrium is here, and if we're bearish, we need the price to get to equilibrium or preferably higher than to go short. In this shaded area here, why did it not just simply trade back to that low and go lower? Why didn't it do that? Think. That's our last up close candle right before the energetic move lower. Inside the context that this is likely a fair value gap that is going to stay open. Why? Because it had no ability to get up until it closed it at all. So that changes the fair value gap to what? A breakaway gap. Breakaway gaps remain open until lower level objectives are fulfilled and delivered and booked. In other words, it goes lower to a specific price level in the discount. Then at a later time, it might come back up to here, but it could be an undetermined amount of time. I don't know when they'll come back to fill in a breakaway gap. And if it's bullish market, everything I just said, just reverse it. This last up close candle prior to the move lower and taking out that dealing range low. That is my ICT bearish order block. It trades lower, comes back up, doesn't really quite get back to that old low, it sells off again, then it comes back, ramrods this low here, goes above it, and then consolidates. So anyone that would have expected this little bit of fluctuation through, this would have wore them out. These are days. These are days of trading, S&P. Shorts are going to be scared. It's probably going to go higher. Why? Because they see a bull flag. Run up, consolidation, and they expect it to go higher. We're bearish. We're in a premium market, and it's going to a bearish order block. Now, price 
is likely to drop lower in reprice and, and target what? What's it going to target? If this is your, your trade, what's it targeting? Well, think about what I taught on this YouTube channel, flagship pattern, the optimal trade entry. From high to low, 79%, 62% retracement levels. That's here. That's my optimal trade entry. So you can use targeting approaches where you put the fib on the bodies here and here, the lowest of the open or close and the highest of the open or close, and your projections down would be right in here. And I'll leave that for you for to study and do it on your own. But we have a fair value gap that's left open, bearish order block, a dealing range that's been broken to the downside. The only thing we've done is retrace back into a short-term premium and retail traders are going to see a bull flag. We're looking at it to go lower. What's it going to go lower for? Before we get into that, we have a short-term low that's taken here. So we had sell side here and it starts to rally back up. What's it reaching for next? It's going to revert back to buy side. That's this here. That's why it's not going to go to simply that level and go lower. It's going to go deeper than to clear off all the buy side liquidity so that way it can absorb that buying orders and translate that to a short position for smart money. So the counterparty is the buy side being attacked here. So shorts in the smart money camp can then target that low down here. So we have buy side taken here. The sell side was taken here. So now the sell side changes to here because the dealing range is now defined by this low and this high because buy side was taken on this high sell side was taken on this low here. So we have a dealing range here. How do we find that useful? We're bearish. So even though this is a fair value gap close to around the equilibrium between this low and this high, that simply would just be a partial. And we hold for what? Sell side to be attacked. But look closer in here. What do you see? Let's zoom in. So here is that area here. And in inside this own area of shadedness, I've taken your attention to this short term low here. So we have a short term low here and then it gets taken out. And then we have this low here and it starts to rally up. Look close. Do you see that this is a swing low? Again, these are daily candles. They're not lower intraday charts. We have a low that takes out sell side here runs down, creates that low, one more smaller attempt to go lower than this day, it does. Then the following day, we open trade down and trade back up. This is a swing low on a daily chart. After we've taken out sell side below here, and we have a short term sell side liquidity pool here, which it runs down into and then creates a swing low. So we're in a discount inside of a discount. Think about that now. If sell side has been taken here, and sell side's been taken here, what's it going to revert back to? Buy side, where's that? Swing high on the daily is here. So if it's going to go here and run to that level, buy side is simply not just that at that level. What's above that? Bingo, our gap. We've been talking about that gap for a couple weeks now. The easy low hanging fruit objective, 3880, I gave that on Twitter and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes, but notice how we had sell side taken here and then the market reverts back to buy side and to an imbalance, that gap. Large range day. Well, how did we know or how could we have known that Friday was gonna be a large range day with an up movement? Well, let's dig into that now. All right, so we finally made our way down into the hourly chart for S&P. Here's our gap from the daily chart that's noted here. And here's that old sell side liquidity pool. And we dug down into that. And I'm going to add some day dividers here so that we can get a little bit of context. I want you to look at the profile of the week. Okay. Now, when I say profile, that is not volume profile. Okay. I do not use volume profile. I do not use footprint. I do not use depth of market. They are all gimmicks. And I know that's going to upset some of your followers that use that stuff. Okay. I promise you the market's not 
moving and booking based on those interpretations. It's simply not. Okay. What I'm about to show you, this is, this is it. This is what makes the market do what it does. Okay. This is how price books. I'll leave it up to you to wrestle with it, but I'm the one making money with these trades and you're over there putting things on your charts, looking at those things and not price action. You're not even relating to how the market is going to deliver on a weekly profile. Weekly profiles are a template. Okay, how should price deliver? I want to walk you through this one here and how I was able to tell you before the fact on Friday that we would see 38.80. So on Monday, we opened from all of this nastiness here on the previous week. The market starts right away on Monday, just starting to go higher, repricing, 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 going higher. No one can go short. No one can go long because it's just constantly just going higher. If you fight that, you're dead. You got to wait for some kind of displacement. When does that occur? On Tuesday, we have a little bit of a movement here and then breaks down. Then sell side is taken. And think about what I showed you on that daily chart. We now have a swing low. So on Thursday, we can anticipate the market doing what? Coming back down to a discount, rallying up, and right about here, that's why I said weekly objective on Twitter is 38.80. Now, why did I pick that? I'll tell you in a moment. But Friday, notice what we have here. The market's already moved above all the consolidation here. It's not likely to do what? Have a sharp movement lower. It's not going to take sell side out because it's already done so here in the consolidation. It's already worked into this fair value gap here twice with a sell stop run there taken out here, digging deeper into this imbalance, leaving the bottom portion of that imbalance open, making it what? A breakaway gap. So it's indicating that it's not likely to have retracements of any magnitude that would see this revisited again. So we had this level taken out here, retraces back down into a short-term discount from low to high. Fair value gap digs into this here. And then once more on Thursday, it rallies, comes back down in, retraces. And this is where I'll talk about what I was wrong about on Thursday, but right about the second part of the day. But Friday, we just started consolidating, had a little bit of a movement on a lower time frame in London, which I'll show you. And then off to the races because the market only had Friday to fulfill a run into that gap. Everybody knew about this gap. Nobody knew when it was going to hit it until around Thursday. And that's kind of like what I was hinting at on Thursday's trading. So on Thursday, I was looking for a run into this level here. And initially I was wrong. And I took a trade and got stopped out plus two points. And while it wasn't a loss, I was incorrect about it running to here. But what I was expecting was, and I mentioned this on Twitter, I was looking for a run up into here and then trade back down in. And I think I did this discussion on the video on this YouTube channel also prior to this video. So I don't know what date that was or what the title was, but just take my word for it. I cover this and talk about what I was looking for and why. But I wanted to see this level taken out here and then drop down into that to be a long and then look for higher prices. It did that, but it didn't give me the run first here, then drop down. Cause I wanted to see this high taken out. I was going to go short there after long. So I was longing, shorting, reversing it, writing it down here. I was going to go long there and then hold for 38.80. That was my plan for the week. That's the, the video I wanted to talk about like right now. That was what I wanted to cover on Friday as a review saying, this is what I did and how I did it and why I did it. But it denied me that run here, but that's fine. This level here, I got in sync with the marketplace, made some cash. And then on Friday, did it again as well. This imbalance right there, that's what I used to justify the run up into 3850. And there's two setups that were made available if you were looking for it too. And we'll cover that now. 3880, this was the tweet. You can see the time on the 23rd. So right in here, right about in there. And the market consolidated. So because it's consolidating, I don't expect it to drop down because everybody wants it to go oversold. They want to see some kind of harmonic pattern, a Gartley, uh, a bullish, you know, 
divergence in some indicators, something to that effect. When the market's this close to the gap or some premium array, and you only have that day before the week closes, when everybody with any insight would know that this is where it's draw, drawing back up into, because it's a gap, it's a real gap. Actual gaps have a tendency of filling in, and it's an obvious target. So I know some of you hardliners in here that are very critical of me. Oh, this is, everybody does this. Everybody does that. Okay, well, post your trade. <laughs> post it that you knew about it beforehand. You outlined it beforehand, and you actually traded it because I already done that. All right, we're going to drop down into a 15-minute time frame. You can see the fair value gap here. We drop down into it in London. Consolidated into another run into that fair value gap in London. And then aggressive run right at the 9 o'clock hour. Market was not going to give anybody an opportunity to see a deeper retracement. And inside this run, I'll show you what it looked like also. But this is the low-hanging fruit objective. This is what I tweeted. This is what I posted on Twitter. The day before, said we would look for 3880. Why is that low-hanging fruit? Low-hanging fruit is the easy objective. This is how I teach my students. Now, obviously, the gap being closed entirely would be up here. Well, it may not have done that on Friday. Well, you had just Friday to get up to this level. It may have just fell short of it. So the low end of the fair value gap is down here. So what's the nice round you know, 10 level into the gap? The first one, 3880. That's why I elected to use 3880. Okay, so that way you know it wasn't just some random number. I told you the logic here as to how I used it and determined. Right away into the one minute chart, you can see at the New York session at 930 equities opening, we see a run aggressively here. Fair value gap. It drops down into it. Buying opportunity if you were trading with the New York 930 opening. And the target, that gap, the shaded area up here, you could be a buyer here. The market rallies up, creates another fair value gap there. Again, thinking about that weekly profile, don't expect it to retrace. Don't expect it to have any kind of movement lower. It's in a hurry, folks. It's been stagnant most of the week, waiting for price to show a willingness to want to go higher. Once it showed that, it wasn't coming back to old resistance broken turn support. Think about what I showed on the hourly chart. Rewind the video back to the hourly. You can see how the market did not, once it broke above, it did not come back down to what logical support level would be seen with retail, seeing old highs broken. Let's wait for it to come back and touch it again. It, that, that doesn't work, folks. <laughs> it's not, not when you have time crunched like it is here. Friday was the day of delivery. Thursday in the evening, one minute after 11, my local time, Eastern time in the United States, I said 3880 is the, the next draw, and that's my weekly objective. Making it public, that way you know there it is. And here's where it went to. Now, you have obviously a setup here, and you have a setup here. No retracements, no funny money, just straight to the draw of that daily gap. So what's the benefit of knowing what the weekly profile is going to be? Knowing where the draw on liquidity is, where is it likely to go? Now, it's not my goal here to devalue my private mentorship because they were told this beforehand. Before the week was going on, we were looking for that. Okay, That's the only distinction that separates this public mentorship versus those individuals that have joined and, they, and you can't join folks. But And please don't get upset because I'm actually teaching you how to do these things. So you don't need me to do that. But that mentorship was there and made available to people that needed that holding of a hand. This is what I think it should do next. And then you study with that, that logic. Here, I'm going to talk about what has already happened. The comment section is open. My students are welcome to come here and post down there and say, I was a liar. If I didn't say this is where the market was going to go. You were told the very night before, but they known days before. Okay, so it's not a, oh, it's going to the gap and I'm lucky here. You know, we knew about it beforehand. But the logic that I use to tell that community, I'm teaching that here publicly as a mentorship. Th this, is, this is the understanding. It's not going to fluctuate. It's not going to be willy-nilly, wishy-washy. It's going to be straight to the point 
And the point requires a lot of explanation. You should want that. If you're satisfied with, this is what it looks like, you buy here, sell here, stop here, there's, you're never going to find consistency with that. Because what makes that set up high probability? That's what's lacking. Look around on YouTube. Look around in every teaching circuit. Everybody wants to do the flash in a pan, cliff notes version of what I teach. And that's why their students suck. Because they have no idea what's going on. Unless they hear me talk about it in my personal private group, then they go and they make their little videos and they make their little courses and they make their little commentaries. But it's my stuff that they're saying. So what I have done is taken that away and laid it out here publicly. And you'll start seeing who's been copying who. <laughs> so granted, Friday was a, you know, is a blistering run higher. Most of you probably didn't participate in it, but I did talk about this very approach to engaging a fair value gap when the market does not do a drop down when it's bullish for a Judas swing and take out sell stops because sometimes it's going to create these opportunities. How could you know it was going to do this? I taught you that in this lecture because of the weekly profile, that gap that was looming above on the daily chart, which is shaded here. The fact that we only had Friday to get to it. And the market was just basically saying, we're not going lower. We're not going to go any lower. And it kept taking out buy side, but not drawing down and completely breaking lower. It would go for a short term area of sell side, but then immediately rebound and go higher to take out buy side again. So what that was indicating to me as the analyst, they're gravitating towards this gap. So you wait each day. Now, I thought that we could have started to run up to it Thursday a little bit better than we did. Like I was expecting a whole lot more energy on Thursday. But because we didn't get that, that's why Friday was it. That was the big hurrah. That was the floodgates opening up and you better be on board or get the hell out of the way. And here you have it. Now, obviously this lesson isn't going to answer everything for all of you. You're going to have a million new questions. And guess what? That's wonderful. That's being mentored because I promise you as we go forward, those questions will get answered and I don't have to do it in a response, in a comment. Just write it down in your journal, questions that need to be addressed. And you watch and see because of the way I talk and teach and show examples, you will get that answer. But it has to come in the natural progression of me teaching the way I teach because I'm not going to change gears. I'm not going to have it your way mentorship mentor. Okay, I'm not going to be that, that person for you. Okay. I like things my way. They name streets after me one way. And unfortunately that rubs a lot of people wrong, but I promise you, if you submit to what I'm doing and teaching you, you're going to get what you're looking for. You're not going to get it on a timeline you want, but you're going to get it perfectly packaged. You'll understand everything as to what it is you're trying to do, what you're looking for, when not to do something. Why should you be sitting still? Why should you be avoiding specific markets? You're going to know all that stuff. And that's what makes a consistent, profitable trader. Because anything apart from what I'm teaching you here, it's gambling. And it's just circumstances that led to you just being right that time. And you're going to attribute that to retail things, indicators, volume profile, Elliott Wave, harmonics, supply and demand, whatever. Put it, fill in the blank. It's, it's all that stuff. And I know that that's what makes a lot of you upset with me because maybe you're making money with some of that stuff. But I promise you, if you go back and look at your examples where you made money, align it with this and you'll see why your trade really worked. And when you failed, look at what I'm teaching and you'll see that's the reason why your trades were failing. I know that sounds arrogant. I know that sounds very pompous, but it doesn't change the fact. It is what it is. Until next time, be safe.